Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. On Friday, China pulled off a diplomatic coup when it brokered a historic arrangement between Iran and Saudi Arabia for the two countries to resume full diplomatic relations in two months' time. So today we ask, what are the international implications of this achievement? And more importantly, what are the implications for the India-China relationship and for China's role in South Asia? Joining me to answer these questions is one of India's greatest and most highly regarded experts on West Asia, former ambassador to Oman, the United Arab Emirates, and twice to Saudi Arabia, and also the author of West Asia at War, Talmiz Ahmed. Ambassador Ahmed, in a deal brokered by China, Iran and Saudi Arabia, who have not had diplomatic relations since 2016, have agreed to resume full ambassadorial level relations in two months' time. Given the ideological, strategic, and even religious differences between the two countries, how difficult would it have been for Beijing to pull this off? I think there has already been a run-up to this agreement. It has been ongoing for some time. Uh, the countries have realized that they need to be engaged with each other. Absence of engagement means that uh, complications uh, do emerge in bilateral relations. There has been a lot of uh, hostile rhetoric and a degree of uh, non-settlement as far as Syria and Yemen are concerned. So I would say that this has been, there has been a certain desire to engage. They have also had five rounds of dialogue in Baghdad and in Muscat. Uh, uh, and I think they made progress, but they were at middle level. And uh, they had to go somewhere further. But in the case of Iraq, the prime minister changed. The new prime minister who came appeared to be more pro-Iran. And I think, therefore, the, uh, the Baghdad option withered away. I think what China has achieved is very significant. China has, has, been, uh, has been a major presence in the region for several years. It is a major buyer of their energy, a major trade partner, investment partner, logistical partner and what have you. So China has been building its presence there. Where it had shied away from was with regard to political issues. That has now changed. I think it was signaled very clearly when Xi Jinping visited Riyadh and had three summits in Riyadh, the bilateral summit, the Gulf summit and the Arab League summit. And I think he conveyed this message. I think in his dialogue with uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, he made it clear that China would be willing to play a role. It is a, They call it quasi-mediation. Quasi-mediation means they bring people together and are available in terms of their good offices. So I think they, and this is a one country that has extraordinary credibility, both in Riyadh and in Tehran. The problems are many. They had a five-day dialogue in Beijing. Uh, there had been a visit of, Prime, of President uh, Raisi from Iran as well, just last month. So Xi Jinping's engagement with the Arabs uh, in December and uh, President Raisi's visit now in Beijing just a month ago, I think that prepared the ground as well.
So yes, now, there were tough negotiations and they have moved well. Now, if I understand your answer correctly, with this deal, China has moved its relationship with both countries from the economic to the political level. And I suspect that that was initially from the Beijing point of view, a gamble. If it had failed, China would have felt very embarrassed. But now that it succeeded pretty spectacularly, does China not only get the credit, but does it also get the benefit, A, of its boldness, and B, of the self-confidence it's shown? You are absolutely right in your remarks. Uh, China had, over the last decade, conveyed that as it had substantial stakes in the region, it did not have the confidence for any political role in the region. It used to, their academics and their diplomats would say, the country is too complicated, we have only arrived here very recently, we are not familiar with the religion and with the culture and with the language. But I must assure you, over the last 10 years, I have seen at first hand Chinese build up, building up their knowledge and their expertise, and therefore their self-confidence. Every major university in the world has Chinese scholars, Every major Chinese university has a center for West Asian studies. They have more than 1,000 West Asian scholars in China. They learn Arabic. And therefore, I would say to you that in 10 years, they have built up a lot of expertise. Now, they needed the political step forward. And that has come. People used to criticize China by saying that, look, you have such high stakes in the region, but you shy away from, from doing anything about it. Obama had called them uh, free riders, if, uh, if, if perhaps even free loaders. Uh, and uh, that had not been uh, well, well received. Because in those days, the Americans never allowed anyone to enter the region. China now has very high stakes in the region's stability. They have, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, they have their own energy stakes, uh, and they have their own economic stakes as well. And they, they are concerned about differences. They recognize, okay. and this is something I should emphasize, they recognize they can't solve problems. Problems can only be solved by the country's concern. But what China can do, it can provide, it can provide what I call quasi-mediation. It brings people together, talks to them nicely, sees that they can uh, talk to each other in a congenial atmosphere and they can move forward in taking their relationship forward. And I think this is the, what is going against to happen. That background, against that background, that China can provide what you call quasi-mediation services, what others call its own good offices. It can facilitate agreements between people who have differences. Against that background, I want to quote to you what the Financial Times has said. The Iran-Saudi deal is a victory for Chinese diplomacy and underscores Beijing's growing clout in the Middle East. Would you agree with that judgment? I think that I, I would agree. They are a very, this is a very significant uh, development. It has changed the diplomatic landscape and the political landscape. The background to this is that the Americans were losing credibility by the day. They looked very confused. They re looked remarkably unsuccessful. They also seemed to be very non-committal in terms of their interests in the region. They, therefore, their allies did not believe that the Americans can be security providers or security guarantors. So they were already on the lookout for other partners. At the same time, I would say to you, the region was coming of age. The onerous burden of accommodating American interests had, I think, completed its use by date. And they were looking at other players. Russia came in as an energy partner and expanded OPEC into OPEC+. Plus. This gave the regional uh, producers the capacity to caucus snook at Biden when he arrived in July and pleaded for increased production. The Chinese have far greater and deeper and more diverse commitments in the region uh, in terms of their energy, etc. And now, as I pointed out, they have the confidence to get into the political engagement as well. So, yes, I would say the diplomatic landscape has changed quite significantly now. The reverse side of China's gain is that this looks like something America has lost or an area where America influence is diminishing. Once again, I want to quote the Financial Times. It says, 
This is a challenge to the United States, whose traditionally strong relations with Riyadh have cooled. So will this both affect the United States Middle East relations, as well as the United States relationship with China, which is anyway troubled and uncertain? Does America now have, in a sense, a troubled situation, both vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and China, because of China's gain and China's interest? I, I agree with you. This is entirely of U.S.'s making. The U.S. has floundered in terms of projecting a coherent strategic vision. What does the Americans, what do the Americans want in West Asia? They've got this huge muscle power, lethal military force. But what, is, what are their interests? What do they want to do? We've never had a coherent approach from the Americans. They flounder. After 9-11, they declared a global war on terror and started bombing the Afghans. Then they attacked Iraq, which had nothing to do with the global war on terror. And then they got bogged down for 20 years in the region. There was a certain West Asia fatigue in Washington with D.C. Because of the absence of any coherent plan or any understanding of what the region is doing. We recall here, isn't it shocking that you have troops in Iraq and Afghanistan for 20 years and your people don't have a single piece of knowledge about these two countries, their culture, their heritage, their dynamics, their interests, etc.? They were depending on the Pakistanis with regard to Afghanistan till the last minute, knowing full well that the Pakistanis are supporting the Taliban. But this is where we are. As the U.S. lost credibility, I would say that the Trump administration accelerated the process. You, you had an administration that was unbelievable. They were constantly saying and doing things and, uh, and you know, floundering. They were co constantly tweeting policy matters, etc. So... So, uh, Americans now, uh, now in the region, Russians and Chinese are the voice of sanity. They are the voice of consistency. They are a voice of getting things done. They don't promise extra, make extravagant promises. They do not use major yeah. military force in the region. They are projecting themselves as benign players, genuinely concerned with the promotion of stability and peace. But the truth is that China has stepped into an area where American influence was ret both retreating and reducing. Now, since America has identified China as the great threat and rival upon whom it will be concentrating its entire diplomatic strategy, do you see the Biden administration's policy to counter, to check and to restrain Chinese influence furthering and growing hereafter? Because suddenly, China looks a much bigger challenge to America than it did before Friday. You have the, in uh, geopolitical terms, you have the rise of a major power in the global landscape. The kind of scenario that prevailed, broad Western domination of the world order and US hegemony leading from the front, that era has been has now gone. We have not only the rise of Russia and China leading, uh, uh, they have become leading uh, powers asserting a role in world affairs. You have the large number of several other countries, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Israel, all of whom are now asserting a degree of independence vis-a-vis -vis the global landscape that has prevailed till today. It is not something that you can wish away. China is going to be with us as an influential role player. What the world, what the American answer has been, a new Cold War, a new binary. This is, this is absurd. But Nobody but wants a new Cold War. That is still the American answer, whether you like it or not, and whether you disagree with it. And my question is this, given that America is determined to check, contain and restrain China, and given that China has now, in a very important sense, scored a victory where America used to exercise influence, do you see that policy of checking and containing China growing? Do you see it getting a harder, tougher edge in Washington? I agree with you. How do you counter China? China has not threatened you. China has, in fact, said they want to work with you. China has said that they don't like hegemony, but they like cooperation. 
they have built up their capacities at home, uh, they have built up economic cloud, they have built up engagements. They have not threatened anybody, nor have they threatened the Americans. All the, uh, all the rush, all the emotive response is coming from Washington, not from Beijing. Beijing is calm, it is quiet, it wants to deal with people in a positive but, but way. My point is this, Ambassador Ahmed, do you see the rhetoric as well as the increased number of strategies from Washington countering China growing? and being implemented and enforced with a greater determination. That's my question. China's leaders knew that America will hate their rise. And for at least 20 years, they kept their rise low key so that they would not be threatened by the Americans. They came out publicly in 2013 when Xi Jinping announced the Belt and Road Initiative. There is no way the United States can hold them back. They may say what they wish in Washington, but the Chinese are here to stay. What the Americans should be discussing at various platforms, how do you engage with the China that has emerged? You cannot go to war. That would be absurd. It would be destructive and it would not lead anywhere. What you we need to do, and that's a diplomatic challenge for the United States, for Europe and for Asia. How do you deal with the rising China so that it can be accommodated in world order rather than become a spoiler? Absolutely. And that question has gained not just greater importance, but greater poignancy as a result of China's achievement on Friday. Before I come to what China's diplomatic coup means for India, I want to ask you about two other areas where this is likely to have a fairly important, if not serious impact. Do you, to begin with, see the conflict in Yemen, where the Saudis and the Iranians are supporting different sides ending? And along with that, do you also see a significant impact in Syria and Lebanon, where the two countries also were frequently at odds with each other? As far as Syria is concerned, the basis for war is over. Bashar al-Assad is not going to be toppled. There's, no, there's not going to be any regime change. Most Arab countries today are busy accommodating Bashar al-Assad. Uh, most of them have opened embassies. The Saudis could also do that at some point. There is talk of calling Bashar al-Assad back into the Arab Spring as well. So I think Syria doesn't seem as grim as it was a few years ago. With regard to Yemen, We've had a year-long truce. Saudi Arabia has legitimate and very su substantial strategic concerns relating to Yemen. It would not, it shares a 400 kilometers of very porous border with Yemen, but it would not like to have a hostile power in Yemen. The problem from the Saudi side, and I blame them for that, is to view all politics in the region f from, the, uh, from the sectarian point of view. Just because the Zaydis are a, a, a Shia group, it was assumed in Riyadh that they are surrogates of the Iranians. They are Can, I interrupt? Can I interrupt? One of the flashpoints between Saudi Arabia and Iran was in fact the conflict in Yemen. The Iranians were supporting the Houthis. The Houthis were often firing missiles into Saudi Arabian territory. Do you see that lessening? Because if it doesn't, then this broking of a new deal between the two countries doesn't mean very much. See, the Saudi assessment was wrong that the Zaydis and the Houthis uh, are uh, surrogates of Iran. They are not. They are independent role players. They have a legitimate stake in the region. Their ancestors ruled Yemen for more than a thousand years. And till recently, the Zaydis were, uh, uh, were and, and had what, reasonable what good relations. What will be the impact on Yemen of this I, arrangement to resume full ambassadorial relations. What I be think the that the result will be, the impact will be very positive. I think that, and as you know, the agreement has been welcomed by the Houthis. Uh, I think the result will be very positive. The, South, the Iranians have much less of a stake in Yemen compared to the Iranians, compared to the Saudis. Saudis have a legitimate stake. Their miscalculation was to see the Houthis as uh, puppets of Iran. They are not puppets of Iran. They are okay. legitimate. They are a legitimate presence in Yemen. I have a feeling that this is what will be conveyed by the Iranians who will promise their good offices. 
but the requirement will be that the Houthis will have to be accepted as an integral part of the Yemeni political and economic order. How the Saudis achieve this uh, is a challenge for them. Iranians are much less active a role player there. What about the Lebanon? Will there be an impact on the Lebanon? You see, the Lebanon issue is not a direct area of conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Saudi Arabia backs the Hezbollah. But Hezbollah has not threatened anybody. They, but again, the Saudis had seen them as a surrogate uh, of the Iranians and therefore a, zone, uh, uh, therefore, uh, a source of threat for Saudi interest. It's not so. Lebanon has very serious problems of its own. Its political order is in a shambles. It needs to get its act together. What Lebanon needs is the support of all countries of the region to, uh, to, uh, to promote its economic and political order as of now. I think all going well. Hezbollah, by the way, is a constructive role player in Lebanon. Yes. They are part of the government. And, regard, and they, have, uh, they have a non-communal approach in Lebanon. So I think what you may find is that absent a discord between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the prospects of improvement within Lebanon are very high. The other country in the region that will be both affected and also in this instance deeply concerned about what China has pulled off is Israel. At the moment, it has its most extreme right-wing government under Benjamin Netanyahu. How will Israel view what's been pulled off by China? You see, Israel today is a deeply polarized country. It has no consensus on any issue. Even with regard to the nuclear agreement with Iran, there are deep divisions within its security establishment, much less its political establishment. I think that Israel needs to get its own house in order. You have seen that half a million Israelis demonstrated in different parts of Israel against Netanyahu's initiative to protect himself from judicial wrath. Now, this is grossly selfish and undermines the democratic and uh, judicial framework uh, but, within but, which... Tell me, how will Israel view this resumption of full diplomatic relations they are concerned. Iran, who it they does were, not they, like, and Saudi Arabia, who it wanted on, to get close to? On the basis of highlighting the threat from Iran, so Israel had hoped that it would be seen as a valid and credible security partner by the Saudis and that the Saudis would reach out to Israel even if they did nothing uh, positive with regard to the Palestinians and continued to kill them. But that is now not a major prospect. If relations between these two Gulf neighbors improve, Israel doesn't become a role player. Israel will then be under pressure to do things with regard to the Palestinians. The Palestinian cause is not withering away. It is not going away, regardless of what the right wing in Israel and the US may say. Israel will ultimately have to deal with the Palestinians. Absolutely. Has... But this is not about the Palestinians. This is about how Israel will respond to the yeah. broking of a very it, diplomatic coup. Ability... And what you're saying is that Israel's hopes of getting closer to Saudi Arabia because of the Saudi and Israeli shared distrust of Iran, those hopes have diminished if they haven't been dashed. Absolutely correct. And I think that is the way the whole politics will pan out. You are yes. likely to see, because the Saudis are deeply committed to the Palestinians. They have no choice. They are a large country. They have a very sensitive uh, population. They themselves have an Arab peace plan on the table. Regardless of whether K King Salman is with us or not, there is no way Prince Mohammed bin Salman can pursue normalization in public uh, so long as the Palestinian issue remains on the front burner. So I think Let's... that the Israelis are losing out here. Okay. The Israelis are in fact the biggest losers in a sense alongside the United States who seen its rival score a victory and a coup in an area where American influence used to be dominant but is now receding. Against that background, let's ask the question, how do you believe this Chinese diplomatic coup will be viewed by New Delhi. At the moment, as far as I know, 
There is no comment or statement made by our Ministry of External Affairs about how they view this achievement. Other countries have welcomed it, but as far as I know, there's only been silence from the MEA in Delhi. Now, let me put this to you. On the one hand, India has traditionally good and close relations with both Tehran and Riyadh. And this is despite the fact that the Saudi Crown Prince and the Iranian Foreign Minister both cancelled visits to Delhi in the last few months. But nonetheless, our relationship with those countries is close and therefore I presume we will welcome them coming closer to each other as well. But on the other hand, we have a very fraught relationship with Beijing. And I don't think we would like or be comfortable with the fact that China gets the credit for bringing Saudi Arabia and Iran closer together. So what do you believe will be the view from the MEA? For far too long, in New Delhi, we have lived with rhetoric and delusion as a substitute for foreign policy. The kind of seriousness of approach supported by a long-term vision of India's interest has been totally absent. And I, it doesn't need Einstein to tell us that you cannot, make, you cannot create a make-believe world of rhetoric and keep on pounding the pulpit saying, what a great nation we are. Everybody loves us. Everyone respects us. That is absolute nonsense. We are so focused on the domestic scenario, so focused on the next election, that we have taken all eyes off serious things that matter to us. Now, let's go back. Uh, let me illustrate. With regard to the Gulf, we have been best placed for several years to be providers of stability and peace in the region. We've had the highest credibility in the region. We have a relationship that goes back 5,000 years. There is a very high degree of cultural comfort on both sides. Every joint statement the Prime Minister entered into in different Arab capitals in the Gulf spoke of the strategic partnership, spoke of the role India could play in promoting stability and also welcomed the very strong centuries-old relationship. I had argued and I have done so for several years and it is attested by the academic papers and articles I've written that India should now give up this approach of uh, having transactional and bilateral relations. That era has gone. What is now, there is a churn in the region. They are looking for new players and India is number one in this regard. If, can we I interrupt? What you're saying, Ambassador Edward, can I interrupt? What you're saying is India had an opportunity to play a greater, bigger, deeper political Absolutely. role. Absolutely. But did not. But did not. <coughs> So now that is a <coughs> that may have passed. I, you me, see, this is I back agree. To the question I asked you: How will Delhi view this diplomatic coup which that China has pulled off? After all, the two countries see, are close friends of ours, but the credit is going to Beijing, with whom we have a very troubled relationship. So how will I Delhi view this? It is an embarrassment. What I would say to you that this is where we should have been. This is what we said. There were several of us who wrote articles. We wrote joint articles on, on saying that, look, India must come in. The region expects India to come in. I also pointed out that India... Yes, sir, but that's the past. That's the past. Those articles yes. were not heeded. They weren't acted yeah. upon. So answer my that's question. It. How today will New Delhi view this? You said it's an India embarrassment. Has, I am, how India, concerned will New Delhi be? India has abdicated all responsibility in terms of promoting stability in the region. We are going back to the ties, uh, which are sustaining ties based on trade, investment, joint ventures, uh, and also protecting our community's interest. We are not going to be the sources of stability and peace that we could have been. And we never expected that China would emerge. But there have been people writing on this that China is building up assets in the region. I myself have written on that. And there are many others, uh, more distinguished people, saying that China's approach to the region is slowly changing. As long ago as 2020, one of my friends in the Gulf wrote an article saying that China's uh, academics are already talking about quasi-mediation policy 
and they are saying that in china is now going to become a political player in the region not a security provider not a security guarantor but an active political okay. and diplomatic player to support his economic engagement so what you are saying is that not only did india have an opportunity to play the role that china has played and pulled off so successfully but india was being advised by people writing articles to say this is your opportunity played but we didn't against that background that we had our opportunity we didn't take it china has taken it and pulled it off miraculously how then will india and china hereafter be viewed internationally would this deal put china on an altogether different and far higher level than india in terms a of their diplomatic clout and in terms b of how the global south responds to both countries uh with the deepest anguish i must say to you karan hardly any country takes india seriously we are so self absorbed and we dine out on delusion and rhetoric that's very difficult to believe anything that emanates here in any case all the rhetoric that we hear in delhi is not directed at foreign audiences it's only directed it's confined to domestic audiences because it has domestic compulsions looking outside it's very clear to me and it's not again you don't need to be einstein the g20 is today day before yesterday's news the g7 has made it clear that they no longer need this platform to engage with developing countries they are totally focused on pursuing their own interests and the issues that challenge them are not issues that need them to be talking with g20 in this background india came up with the idea of being the voice of the south i support that i believe that is the way it is part of our legacy it no, is but, part but, of our nehruian order there? can i interrupt you there given that india is now portraying itself as the voice of the south and china is the country that's pulled off this incredible diplomatic coup in the middle east which is very much a part of the south how will those global south countries view the two india and china have we lost out to china in their eyes is china now on a higher diplomatic level than us that's my question i i don't believe world affairs functions on the basis of a zero sum game i yes there are challenges yes there are rivalries yes there are competitions but we should be able to be credible with regard to being the voice of the global south there is enough space for both china and india to play a constructive role in the south we should be where we lack where the chinese are uh, do better than us they are very clear headed very committed they have a vision they garner the resources to support that vision and they also locate the personnel who will see through their interests in our case we tend to have lot more rhetoric and very little substance in terms of follow up i don't necessarily criticize only the political leadership you need diplomacy diplomats have to be deployed for this purpose resources have been to be provided we okay. talk of africa it is one huge continent but we we have done a lot over there you need to do a lot on a long term basis come up with ideas okay. there is enough space in the south for both china and india and i believe india has a legitimate role there now as i said india has of course excellent relations with both riyadh and tehran which is one reason we would welcome the two of them getting closer to each other but our neighbor pakistan has equally good relations with riyadh and tehran the difference is islamabad also has excellent relations with beijing which we don't islamabad and beijing are all weather allies now clearly there will be i imagine in islamabad not just satisfaction that their ally has pulled off a diplomatic coup but also a measure of satisfaction that india is discomforted by this yes i think that would indeed be the case you see pakistan is in such a parlous situation that it rejoices at these small achievements and small victories i tend not to see pakistan as a serious challenge nor am i agitated too much 
with regard to whether uh, they uh, they are uh, happy or not i am more concerned with india's interest india's interest we have let iran down very 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 frequently right from 2003 when chabahar was offered to us and we were allowed to construct all those roads uh, to afghanistan central asia and moscow and we subordinated our relationship to our ties uh, with the united states in the donald trump we accepted in full the uh, very onerous conditions of the sanctions and again let down the iranians and our relationship with them what did the chinese do the chinese never stopped buying iranian oil not only did they have they been buying a lot of oil from china from iran they have signed a 25 year comprehensive security strategic partnership agreement which is said to be about 400 billion dollars or what have you in the case of saudi arabia what i have noticed and i again say this with deep anguish where is the political leadership leading from the front have is our relationship now in the hands of corporations is that what we have done that we have created the space and the companies rush in i believe the gulf is far more important to us in terms of our long term strategic interest you would say to me or oh, this is now yesterday's news yes it is but i have to emphasize this because very few people are doing that that okay. there are opportunities for us which we should have seized even now i am saying to you that the kind of ties we should have with the gulf don't corporatize them they must be intensely security based intensely political and strategic we are not doing any of that and that let is what my regret is let me come to another aspect of what i call the india china rivalry india believes that it is and ought to be the preeminent power in the south asian region after all we are by far the largest economy the largest country and as far as the world is concerned the most important country however increasingly china is a rival of ours in south asia what will be the impact on china's influence in south asia of this diplomatic coup that china has pulled off and i don't just mean nepal bangladesh and sri lanka i mean afghanistan and in particular i mean bhutan that's one area where the india china rivalry is most pronounced so what Absolutely. will be the impact of china's influence in south asia Uh, very clearly the days of the raj are over the raj in british india was the dominant presence in south asia it could also cow down china at that time and tibet that era is gone and we should have been realistic enough the kind of what happened is we inherited the mindset of the raj as far as south asia is concerned and forgot to look at the rest of the context in which that had flourished you cannot tell any country today that i have the monopoly of relations with you and i will determine your foreign policy and i will determine your security interests that's not going to happen and the minute you do that you are opening the ground for these very same countries who have been historically engaged with india looking at other options as well and the kind of tone that we use the kind of demands that we make the kind of uh, bargains uh, we seek to impose upon them none of that is acceptable in south asia therefore But on the flip side on the flip side will chinese influence in south asia now grow because china has established this pretty incredible relationship restarting full diplomatic relations between saudi arabia and iran will that enhance china standing give it a it louder already, voice and increase its influence further karan it has already been very substantial well before this uh, iran saudi agreement it is based on the dynamics of the region it's very very clear that india has lost a lot of credibility in south asia and we are we need to do something quite different uh, my approach is that south asia each country in south asia must be treated with respect it must be told we are not hegemonic we are here to look after your interest to the extent you are comfortable with it yes we will support you wherever you need but we are not going to be the big brother that you have sensed up to now 
Okay. We have certain strengths and we have certain capacities and they don't want to be wedded to one power over another. They want to carry the option. India must be a credible option. My last question, Ambassador Ahmed, could this Chinese diplomatic coup have an impact on the forthcoming Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit as well as the G20 Summit, both of which are going to be happening in New Delhi sometime in the next six months? After all, <laughs> China and Iran are members of the SCO. China and Saudi Arabia are members of the G20. So could there be an impact on both those summits? While China has pulled off a significant diplomatic coup, it does not enjoy exclusive relations with any country. As I mentioned earlier, all countries in the region want to have a multiplicity of engagements and not a single country will ever turn its back on India. The challenge therefore upon us is to be credible partners, actually partners that are truly engaged. What has been missing, uh, Karan, has been a lack of seriousness of long-term commitment and purpose because of the obsession with things domestic. All the rhetoric and all the illusions that have been projected are at the domestic audience. I don't believe it will impact either the G20 summit or the SCO. They are all very mature countries. All of them respect India. All of them would be present in, num in good numbers at these summits. But let us look beyond the tamasha of the summit. Where are we going substantially? Okay. I believe that this is again a wake-up call to India that for far too long we wasted our resources uh, cultivating domestic audiences for domestic purpose, pursuing agendas that, no, that not necessarily do much credit to us. As I have said to you before, and I say it again, Vasudeva Kutumbakam must be a reality at home before it can be accepted abroad. And you think Absolutely. that the people don't know these things abroad? So I would say to you, that be credible, be serious, be have a long-term vision, provide resources for your uh, to support your vision. You are still respected, and there will be things we can do. Ambassador Ahmed, thank you very much for making time for me, and in particular for explaining the multitude of implications of what I call China's diplomatic coup. It's a matter on which I should point out to the audience that up till now, today. Monday the 13th, there is silence from the MEA and South Bloc. We do not know, officially at any rate, how the Indian government responds to this. And that leads to the concern, or perhaps I should say suspicion, that the fact that China gets the credit and the fact that this elevates China to a diplomatic level that is higher than India in the eyes of not just the Global South but many other countries would be discomforting. Understandably so. But nonetheless, that is how it does seem if the government continues to say nothing. I thank you for joining me. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.